Hello, everyone. This is David Sharon from the Lester Center. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's great to see the class going again. I wanted to welcome some people to this class. This is the Life as an Entrepreneur's class uh, here for the Haas School of Business. As a special uh, set of guests that we have here tonight, we have some competitors from the international environment. We're running a program called the Intel Berkeley Technology Entrepreneurship Challenge. Uh, it is an international business plan competition. Uh, if you come to the Entrepreneurs Forum on Thursday night, you'll get to see some of them present. And I just wanted to recognize we have some Chileans here in the front of the room. Victor, good to see you. Um, let's see, I think we have some Germans in the back there. Do we have any Brazilians in the room? Our Brazilians are here. Excellent. Any Russians in the room? I see Alexi and Yuli over there. Uh, and Chinese team? In short, you can tell we have a lot of wonderful people, wonderful teams here from other engineering schools, other business schools around the world. And uh, please join me in giving them a quick round of applause to welcome them here to Berkeley. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Adrian to introduce our speaker. Thank you, David. Uh, bienvenido, bienvenido, ni hao, auf Wiedersehen. No, good and all that stuff. Uh, just before we kick in, I'm very, very excited tonight that we have Kristen Richmond, the CEO and founder, uh, co-founder of Revolution Foods. But before she gets to speak and tell us about the past few years and the excitement there, we're just going to invite up Evan here to tell us about a quick club here on the Berkeley campus, which may excite you. So, 30-second pitch, go for it. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we've got a lot of guests here uh, come to see Kristen. She is a graduate of this fine institution in 2006, where she was an outstanding member of a business school community, finding a partner, business partner, having a baby, co-running GSVC, winning GSVC in 2007. Before business school, she did things as diverse as uh, working in a school in Nairobi since business school, she has been involved with making Revolution Foods quite a success. So I would like to ask you to please applaud uh, Kristen as we hear her story. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, is this working? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, it's a real honor to be here. I was telling Adrian, and of course Dave knows, this is really where a lot of, uh, a lot of everything started for Revolution Foods. So um, just keep in mind as I speak that I, I love Haas and this school more than anything. Um, it's as, as Adrian said, it's where I met my business partner, uh, wrote the business plan for my company, founded the company, funded the company, um, had my first child. As you guys can tell, I'm five, five and a half months along on number two. Um, so just great memories um, coming back here and, and speaking to you guys. And I just want to make it a really interactive conversation. I'm guessing a lot of you are really focused on how you start a company, how to utilize your graduate school experience, whatever school you're coming from, um, or undergraduate experience to the best degree possible to get something up and running. And I love talking about that. So I'm going to you know, talk for a few minutes in this presentation and tell you a little bit about Rev Foods. But then I really do want to open up the floor to questions around you know, how did you guys manage to do that while in school? What were the key pieces that needed to come together? What have been the key challenges since starting it? Um, so just know I'm, I'm really open, and I'd love to make it interactive. So raise your hand whenever you have a question or thought, because um, I think that'll be most valuable for everyone. So I'm just going to play a quick, um, quick clip to give you an idea of what Revolution Foods is. I think it's three minutes long, a um, little under three minutes long, but it'll give you an idea of what we do. I mean, in a nutshell, Kirsten, Toby, and I, who's also a Haas grad, uh, founded Revolution Foods in 2006 to provide fresh, healthy, delicious meals to students. Um, and that's students, uh, I, I want to emphasize one of our core pieces of our mission was to fund um, provide this food to students with the least amount of access. So while we believe very strongly that all students deserve uh, access to healthy meals every day in nutrition education, there's clearly um, dynamics in our communities that um, you know, enable certain students to have more access and student, certain students to have less access. So if you look at the students we're serving right now, about 75% of um, the students who eat breakfast, lunch, and snack every day from Revolution Foods are low-income students. And for a lot of these students, it's, it's really their only um, reliable, certainly reliable, healthy meals of the day. So we're uh, very, very proud of what we're doing. Um, and let, let me let you see it for yourself. This was a, a, a quick clip that was done in um, 
Los Angeles uh, a couple weeks ago at one of our partner schools, Para Los Niños. Only one in five school-age children gets five or more servings of produce daily, with less than a third drinking milk on any given day. But one Los Angeles charter school is looking to change those statistics by offering organic and locally grown food for their children. Our food coach, Lori Corbin, takes a look. This appears to be a typical school lunch at first glance, but there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. Burrito, and we're having an orange, and low-fat milk. But this isn't a standard issue school burrito. Potter Los Ninos' Bob Karcher says this is one made with brown rice, free-range beef, and organic beans. The fruit's locally grown, and the milk is free of antibiotics and growth hormones. Simply putting the right food in front of the children every day starts to build habits that stay with them throughout their life. Here at Para Los Niños Charter School in downtown Los Angeles, over 400 students from low-income families get free breakfast, lunch, and snacks daily that cost three to four dollars a meal to make. Donors and fundraisers help put school dollars towards this unique program from Revolution Foods in an attempt to fight obesity, improve test scores, and well-being. A lot of cases, the only opportunity they have to really eat a good, strong, healthy meal. Of course, this food helps keep them full and satisfied, but also provides some lessons about the importance of good nutrition for both their mind and body. What they eat and how they eat is so important to them being success successful in their education. Along with preparing fresh meals daily, Carolyn Child says nutrition education is served as well, which they make fun through puzzles, games, and newsletters for the families. But when it comes down to the student level, for them to take these choices outside of the schoolroom, they need to understand why. The Los Angeles Unified School Lunch Program has made significant progress in the last two years. Almost all offer fat-free or low-fat milk, serve fruits and vegetables, with over 80% serving salads and yogurt. But the meals remain high in fat and salt and are highly processed. And that's something these educators want kids to do without. It's a big component of helping them perform well throughout the day, physically as well as mentally, so that they can have uh, better test scores and, and have better just healthy lifestyles. Lori Corbin, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Great. So that gives you guys an idea. Um, let's see. get set up here. Um, gives you guys an idea of what we do and um, it's, uh, you know, to give you an idea of, of where we've come to. Um, when I was at Haas in our, in our second year, Kirsten and I um, actually met in our new product development class, which some of you may be taking or may plan on taking, um, and spent that time in our class talking to um, probably 50 local schools um, and talking to parents and teachers and community members and students and administrators about what they wanted to see in their meals. And um, there was a widespread agreement that what they were serving their students was not acceptable and nutritious and that it wasn't setting them up for success. Um, and we spent our time just running survey after survey after survey, um, getting to know what these schools were looking for. And the truth is, I, I really don't think anyone had ever asked these schools before what they wanted to see in their platform. Um, and I think we've continued to build upon that model since the day we started, which has been just um, totally, totally critical to, uh, to you know, um, adding schools, keeping schools, and just the great word of mouth that's helped us grow. Um, so just to, just to back up a little bit to talk about where, um, where I came from um, in this journey, um, I actually started my career in investment banking um, in high-yield bonds, and I was on, let's see, Wall Street for four to five years, um, learned a lot, and learned a lot about working very hard and being incredibly analytical, um, which was a, a wonderful experience for me, but decided, you know, after, I think I was 26 at the time, decided to, um, to make a change and to uh, focus on a career that I really thought would have a lot of impact and use my business skills at the time. And I, I moved overseas to, uh, to Nairobi, Kenya, and had the opportunity to co-found a school there for children with learning disabilities. And my role was obviously not as an educator, but as the fundraiser, the facilities person, the sort of in-house CFO and, and sort of operating um, person on the team and learned a ton during my time there, but specifically learned that um, I wanted to focus in the realm of education and the realm of 
creating um, better learning institutions for kids with less access. Um, moved back to the US and went to work for a nonprofit called RISE that focuses on teacher recruiting and retention in low-income schools. And those of you who, who might be familiar with education know that that's another huge hot-button issue, is just how do we keep the best and brightest teachers in our schools, particularly low-income schools. But what I learned in that job was that um, I sort of looked back at my experience and I said, well, you know, I, I was helping scale this nonprofit from the, I was the second person on the team, so very early, um, early member and helping scale it from the Bay Area to LA to Chicago. I looked back at my experience and said, in Nairobi and said, hey, I, I co-founded a school in Nairobi. I looked back before that to my experience in investment banking and I had split off with my managing director um, to help form a new high yield group within the bank as the definitely the low, low man on the totem pole. I was the, sort of the founding analyst. But nonetheless, this realization struck me that, hey, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I like doing. I like starting up things. I like growing things. Um, that's, that's what I really enjoy doing. And when I was in these schools at RISE, working with them on keeping their great teachers in the classroom, I would always ask, you know, what are the ideas that you guys have for, you know, different resources that you need to be successful? Um, and I was always asking these questions. And time and time again, teachers would say to me, you know, our Nutri our, the options that we serve our children in our lunchroom are absolutely horrific. You know, we teach our kids one thing about how to take care of themselves, health and wellness, nutrition education, fitness. When we go in the lunchroom, we're serving them Cheetos, taco pockets, you know, corn dogs. Basically, I'll show you pictures in a minute. Well, I think I can even fast forward. <laughs> Basically, this is what was being served. I mean, these are our pictures. These are our pictures from, uh, from our, I mean, you guys probably remember the Mystery Meat days if you were in public schools. And I mean, honestly, this is what was being served to the kids. This is from Haas, for second year of my Haas um, MBA program, pilot, you know, running, uh, running these surveys in MPD class. So time and time again, teachers would say, it's just, it's completely unacceptable what we're serving our kids. And we don't have any other options. So I came back to business school um, with a, a real focus on starting a company that would provide fresh, healthy meals to students. And knowing that despite, you know, when you try to start something up, for those of you that have or will, you hear a lot of reasons why you're not going to be able to do it. You know, in my case, it was students aren't going to eat the food. They'll, ne you know, they'll never eat healthy food. Um, it's too expensive. Um, you know, it's just, it's not possible to do what you're trying to do. And, you know, all of those reasons why you shouldn't do it. And I think Kirsten and I set out to obviously prove that wrong, <laughs> but we knew there was a huge market opportunity because we were listening to the customers out there talk to us and say, we want this to happen. In fact, I remember a, um, uh, a, pr a principal saying to me, who he, he himself is an MBA, and this is no knock on the MBA program, but said, please don't make this another you know, business school project. Please start this company when you graduate. You know, and I got that feedback. And um, so I met Kirsten uh, in, in one of my classes, and we just clicked. I mean, she had come more from the education and sustainable food systems side of the equation, but was very focused on um, creating a uh, a better option for students and out of the crisis in, in childhood obesity that we're seeing in our country right now. So we join forces and I can tell you for those of you who um, once again have started or will start companies, I mean I personally just love having a partner um, that I can work with and depend on and it's been a, uh, it's been a fabulous uh, ride for the two of us together. So we join forces and at that point, um, you know, it was a uh, focusing on Revolution Foods pretty much nonstop alongside our classes. I think we uh, dedicated our new product development class to Rev Foods. We dedicated our marketing research class to Rev Foods. We dedicated our um, social entrepreneurship class. Um, Kirsten was leading Net Impact and I was leading GSVC. Um, I've since, we've since hired uh, the other, the co-president um, with me of GSVC, Ben Kane, who now works at Revolution Foods. Um, but we really, really focused on taking our second year classes and applying them to the company that we wanted to start, which was a great use of time. And I can tell you, I've never, I've never gotten better grades than in that second year because I, I cared so much about you know, what we were doing with these classes in relation to uh, the company we were trying to start. And the other thing is, you know, I found that you know, kudos to my Haas classmates, everyone wanted to work on it with us because they were so enthusiastic about the opportunity and about being part of helping their classmates um, start something that was you know, going to make a difference and hopefully be a successful business. Um, so that's a little bit of the background at Haas, but then we came back, um, you know, after running the company for a year, came back to compete in GSVC 
uh, one year out of school, and that was successful for us, so very exciting. Um, so a little more about Rev Foods, and like I said, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk a ton more, but um, so we founded it in July 2006 to help build healthier school communities. Um, we felt strongly about not only providing the food to students um, that would be healthy and nutritious, but also nutrition education. So you're not just putting great food in front of students, but you're also kind of asking them to ask, why am I eating this? How is it making me feel? You know, what difference does it make as I'm, um, you know, thinking about health as I'm getting older and thinking about fitness and thinking about all kinds of things. We talk about portion size and um, how to create healthy snacks. We'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but helping them think about um, why they're eating it as well as, as eating it. Um, how, how did we do this? That's probably one of the top questions on your mind. Um, well, we, uh, once again, spring semester, second year, kind of said to ourselves, um, who do we need to partner with to make this happen? Um, neither one of us came from the food industry. Both of us came from, as I said, sort of business education. Um, and we looked around at the market and we said, who's the leader in natural foods? Because we, know, we knew that we wanted to have natural and organic foods incorporated in our platform. And that, that was a pretty obvious um, <laughs> uh, answer for us. Whole Foods was a great leader. We actually had a, a classmate in business school who was working at Whole Foods Northern California, which is right down the street in Emeryville. Um, in addition, the president of Whole Foods, Nor uh, Walter Robb lives in Marin, so it's a, it was a great um, chance for us to get in front of some real leaders at Whole Foods and, and came in with a you know, five-page PowerPoint deck to uh, some of the, the great leaders of Whole Foods and said, this is our vision, this is what we want to do. We want to take natural organic and organic foods and provide this food at an affordable level to kids in the community who don't have access through your stores. And the reception was unbelievable. Um, the timing was unbelievable. That's you know, another thing, just the timing of the, the focus on childhood obesity and what's going on in our community right now. Um, they said, we've just started a task force on obesity. We'd love for you guys to be our first initiative. So talk about great timing. Um, we were able to form this partnership with Whole Foods to help us um, leverage their purchasing power as the leader. We were, you know, when you're a little company, you don't, you don't have that purchasing power. So to be able to tap into their network of healthy food suppliers as well as what they were producing um, through their commissaries and be able to access that at reduced prices for the students we were serving. Um, for those of you who are taking CSR and those type of classes, I mean, you can imagine the, the impact for them of being able to say, you know, we're working with this local organization that's supporting local kids in our schools. Really great message for them to be sending out to the local community and to the national community. And in fact, the Rev Food story is, is the front of the CEO of Whole Foods um, has Rev Foods in one of his, you know, first PowerPoint slides that he does in his presentations around how they demonstrated local support in communities. Um, so we were able to tap into this network of healthy food suppliers as well as Whole Foods through that initial Whole Foods partnership. Um, if you're wondering how, how, how much we've grown, so we started out with four schools in our first year. Um, we grew to 10 by the end of our first year. We launched our second year with 40, and we launched our third year this year with 100 schools, as well as a whole host of after-school programs, summer camps, summer schools. So we serve the whole um, ed spectrum from pre-K um, so we're working with a bunch of the Montessori and Head Start programs in um, the greater Bay Area all the way to 12th grade. So a big, big group of students. And now we're serving about 20,000 meals a day, um, which, is, which is exciting. And we, in our second year, we launched a second market in Los Angeles. So while we were moving, um, you know, growing in the Bay Area, word spread very quickly. And a lot of the charter leaders that we were serving in the Bay Area um, talked to their counterparts in L.A. And L.A. came knocking and said, we really you know, a lot of schools were interested in what we were doing and we wanted to move fast. Um, and so we opened, we, we opened LA um, and we're now looking at our third market, which probably looking very closely at DC and Denver right now. Um, let's see, so wanted to talk a little bit about, I'm not gonna get into depth in financials, but I think, you know, it's important to think about sustainability. Um, one of the great things that we've been able to do is really in our first year, um, you know, proof of concept around the food, it's working, the kids are loving it, and then proof of concept around the economic model. So we've been running at average gross margins of around 25% since the day we started. Um, while that may not seem high to you in the tech world or wherever you're coming from for, you know, food service, very respectable margins, and um, one of the important things when you're going out to raise funding, and I'm guessing there'll be some questions on that, but we've now raised three rounds of funding. 
um, you know, people, investors need to see that, that proof of economic model. So in our Bay Area, in our LA market, we're now, the markets themselves are, are break even at this point, which is very exciting. Um, over 75% of the meals we serve are going to low income students. So as I said, that's a really key part of our mission and um, you know, a key part of why we're out there doing what we're doing. And we're starting to see impact. So um, really, I mean, this is my most exciting message of tonight, I think, is just you know, the, the impact that we are seeing. We're seeing student bodies slimming down. We're seeing an increased attention in class in um, the later hours of the day where students had just crashed beforehand. Um, we're seeing on, on playgrounds in our elementary schools, a lot of the playgrounds have recess after lunch we're see where there used to be a host of disciplinary problems. We're seeing those disciplinary problems cut down because kids aren't you know, spiking on sugar at lunch and then crashing down. Um, we're seeing one of the most exciting ones. We're seeing students who are going home to their families and changing eating habits. So for instance, um, we serve a fresh fruit and vegetable with every single meal and or every single lunch. We serve a piece of fresh fruit with breakfast and snack as well. But um, you know, one of the schools I visited in Richmond right up the road, um, one of the high school women had opened her meal and said, you know, what is this looks like hot mango in my meal. And it was, it was organic roasted butternut squash. And um, she'd never had it before. And she tasted it and she's like, this is delicious. And so she told me about how she took her mom, you know, that weekend to buy butternut squash, which is something that, you know, she's like, we eat fast food all the time. Like to go to the produce market and to buy, you know, fresh veg. It's just an exciting story. So we're hearing stories like that all over the place, how these practices are impacting families beyond the school. And we've grown a company that has, our company has 100 employees now, which, you know, it, it's funny, when we started the company, um, I would say, you know, the mission of healthier schools is certainly our primary mission, but very quickly, um, as, as a leader, you start to realize that the jobs you're creating are equally important. So we have 100 employees, and I'd say 70 of those come from low to moderate income households in Oakland and in um, inner city LA. And these are, many of these people came from minimum wage jobs. Um, you know, this food service industry is known for just not great working conditions, um, you know, just terrible kind of living standards for employees in a lot of cases. And we're able to offer people above livable wage, full health benefits, um, and ownership to every person in the company. So everyone in our company, whether you're a janitor, dishwasher, driver, doesn't matter who you are, you have access to ownership in our company if you're with us for a year. So that's uh, one of the really exciting pieces of the story. And I would say, um, you know, actually Kirsten, my, my business partner right now is presenting to the city council in Oakland um, for a half a million dollar loan for a new facility um, at a very, very low interest rate. And I know you're all familiar with the, the, uh, the economic climate right now. Um, that's not, you know, it's not a, a common thing right now to be looking at a 5% loan as a young company. And the reason that hopefully we'll get that loan is because we are creating jobs. Um, for low-income folks in the community, good jobs. So, you know, that's, I would say, if you ask me what are, you know, what are some of the most rewarding parts of the job, it's coming into the office every day and, you know, seeing families of people that are now working for us and are proud of their jobs and are happy with their jobs and are recommending it to their, you know, aunt or uncle or grandmother or daughter or whatever it might be. So, um, very proud of that. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what food used to look like. <laughs> let's, let's look at what it looks like now for many of our students. So these are some examples of Rev Foods meals. People ask me, you know, what, what are some of your meals? So my favorite meal, um, it's pretty much been my favorite meal since the day we started, is, you know, just an all-natural chicken, so no hormones, um, hormone-free chicken, an organic Whole Foods barbecue sauce on top of roasted Yukon Gold organic um, potatoes with an ear of fresh corn on the cob and a fresh plum or tangerine or apple, depending on the season. So it just kind of gives, our, our, gives you an idea of our meals. Our meals are fresh, they're home style. Um, you know, they're very approachable. So it's really, really important that um, our students feel like these meals are approachable. They need to be healthy, but when we talk about healthy, it's really having real, fresh, natural ingredients. So it's kind of bringing the cooking back to school lunch, which disappeared somehow. Um, so bringing that, that fresh home style approach back to school lunch. Um, so we don't serve anything fried, we don't serve anything processed, we don't serve anything reheated. Everything's made fresh every day. We have a fabulous team of chefs that work for us that make this food fresh every day and really put a lot of care into it. Um, we base our menus on local and seasonal items. We use as much organic um, and local as we can. 
Um, every lunch is served with fresh fruit and vegetable, I think I said. Um, all meats are hormone and antibiotic free, as well as our dairy. We work with Clover Stornetta, which some of you guys may know is a great um, dairy collaborative in Marshall, right up the road um, in Marin. So we try to work, we also work with the Community Alliance of Family Farmers, so bringing fresh, um, local produce and dairy into our meals and then telling the kids the story of those producers so they can actually, they actually know where their food is coming from. Um, and we never use high fructose corn syrup. So that's something that you see in many, many processed foods now. So Rev Foods in Action, you saw a little bit of this in the tape, but I just wanted to show you. Um, these are students eating you know, one of our classic meals. It's a homemade pasta with um, all natural beef marinara. Um, I think this one's with broccoli as well. Um, Clover, uh, clover milk and an apple. But these are a lot of the faces we see at schools every day. Um, so our food partners, um, some of you who are kind of who know the food world out here might recognize it or if you go to Whole Foods a lot or one of the natural food stores, um, but certainly Whole Foods, UNFI, Diestel, which is a local turkey farm. Joan Diestel prides herself on knowing all of her turkeys and naming them <laughs> um, back to nature. But I mean, we're talking, they know, you know, this is, this is the real deal. Um, Organic Valley, we have a host of um, sort of national and local suppliers so that when we scale, um, I mean, that was one of our key, key um, goals was to scale this platform to as many students as possible, which means going to new markets. So when we went to Los Angeles, we want to be able to call on, you know, a host of local and a host of national suppliers to help us with those expansions. Nutrition Ed, I talked a little bit about this key part of our platform is really getting out and talking to students about you know, portion size, juice, healthy snacking. Um, we have all kinds of nutrition education activities. We host Iron Chef competitions at our kitchen where we have high schoolers come in. Actually, Amy Klein, our executive chef, was down in San Diego today doing a huge Iron Chef competition with a big high school down there. So we really try to get kids engaged in uh, the culinary arts and, and what they're eating in a fun way. Um, sample menu, I'm gonna skip past this because I think it's, I've given you some examples, but, um, and give you more food examples, just very approachable. And we develop our menus from what the kids want. I mean, I think this is a really important part of our success as we go out to our schools and we say, what do you want to see? And are there menus at home that your parents have cooked that we don't know about? And if so, can you submit a recipe? We'll take something like, you know, chicken nuggets and we'll create our own healthy chicken nuggets. So instead of a processed, um, Lord knows what's in it, a uh, piece of meat, it will be a, a Rev Foods chicken nugget, which is an all-natural piece of, uh, an all-natural chicken breast breaded in whole wheat breadcrumbs that we save from the heels of our bread that we make our sandwiches with, um, you know, baked, seasoned, seasoned in panko, salt and pepper, and, you know, baked and then served with organic ketchup. So we try to create healthy um, versions of what students are used to seeing in fast food where we can. Um, and then customer feedback. I mean, these, these are some of the key messages. Kids want healthy meals and, and the testimonials behind it. They're willing to try new things. Oh, did I lose it? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, and kids and parents like our meals. So I think one of the comments that we hear all the time from schools is just this platform matches what we want to see for our students. So school partners, um, we talk a little bit about, I've talked a little bit about this already, but you know, school community helps us build our menus, helps us deserve, um, develop our service platform, um, and help us, helps us develop our nutrition education offering. So we really like to work directly with our schools, and that's where we've learned and um, you know, developed our platform since the day we started. Business standards, I've also talked a little bit about this, but um, you know, I've talked about our employee standards, which are a key part of how we operate in terms of livable wage and ownership for everyone. Um, we hire from our school communities, so we try to actually get out and hire um, from the school communities we serve, which is a great way to reinvest in the community and as an employer to hire people who care a lot about what they're making every day and are gonna put extra care and effort into it. Um, from an environmental standpoint, we're actually switching our entire platform over to 100% compostable um, packaging as of January 1. Um, most of our platform has been green, but we're making a huge investment in that, so making sure that we you know, leave as little of a footprint as we can and that we're really teaching kids and schools about um, running a green platform. And we recycle and compost everything in production. So we try to run green facilities, and um, we now have two. We're building our third. Um, and that's, that's an area that we're very focused on as well. So what are we going to do this year? Um, we, and we're already 
in doing this. I'm actually on a plane to Denver tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to scale our, our Los Angeles presence to a full-scale market, 8,000 meals per day, which we're doing. Um, we're going to continue to grow our Bay Area market, which we have, um, we're now at that 13,000 meal mark. Um, we're going to launch a third market for the 2009 school year. So that's something that, it was funny, I was just up talking to Jerry Engel. I mean, we, um, you know, with the situation um, in sort of the capital markets right now, it's something that we're talking a lot about. Should we grow? Should we hover, you know, hold and hover and really develop our markets? And that's a, that's a decision point that we're making with our board right now. But it's interesting for Rev Foods. I mean, we've been growing and growing. The demand is there. And, and for instance, in Denver for us, um, there's a group of, of local leaders, foundations, and school leaders, and, and politicians who really want Rev Foods to come and are, are creating incentives for us to come and launch a third market there. So these are some of the strategic decisions that we're making right now. Um, launching a fresh cook chill platform in San Diego, so figuring out how we can leverage our existing facilities in the Bay Area and LA to serve Sacramento, the Valley, San Diego. So how can we use technology and food to keep our product quality high, but actually not make additional um, facilities investments and be able to serve those outer markets? Um, and then we're researching um, you know, additional markets coming up. And you know, where do I spend a lot of my time? Well, lately, I hate to say it, on a plane. Um, you know, I'm, I'm out there talking to leaders in, in DC and Denver and New Orleans and Phoenix and Houston about um, you know, coming to their market and what it would look like. And like I said before, I sort of alluded to how we're encouraging markets to sort of, uh, I should say, woo us in a way. So what kind of facilities um, environment could look good for us in a market or if we're guaranteeing to hire a certain amount of um, local employees, what kind of benefits can we um, expect to see in terms of financing or facilities or you know, what kind of programs can we tap into like that in the local communities? I think this is my last. Yeah. So that's my last slide. Um, I'd love to take, take some questions for the last 15 minutes and kind of hear what's on your mind. Yeah. Well, so that's a complicated question, um, but part of it is these, uh, the partnerships that we've created on the supply side. Um, so really trying to work with a group of suppliers who are going to you know, work with us on pricing of, of the goods that we serve, or the, the ingredients that we incorporate in our meals. Um, that helps when you're growing um, because you're able to access volume discounts. And so if we can say to, you know, the Community Alliance of Fam Family Farmers, if we're able to order, you know, 10,000 local organic apples a day starting in August, you know, how can you work with us to keep that price point down so that we can serve it to the students that we're, we're setting out to serve? We also just run an incredible, I mean, we are so conscious of cost in our kitchen and waste. Um, we cost out every menu to the half penny. It's a lot of work. I mean, there's no, there's no silver bullet, but I'd say some of the strategic partnerships really, really help. So, uh, sure. Um, so it's interesting. It depends on where, where you're talking about. Um, I think in the Bay Area, there's no one doing precisely what we're doing. Um, there's certainly people providing healthy organic meals to um, affluent schools. So in the private school market, there are a lot more um, players out there. In, in the market we're directly serving, most of the people serving them are school districts. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, our influence, when you talk about a mission of kind of transforming school lunch and creating healthier schools, Rev Foods influence has had big time, is, is now really starting to get on the radar screen of like Oakland Unified School District and San Francisco Unified School District because parents are seeing this change in the charter schools and the kind of schools bordering the, the district schools and saying, hey, we want that food for our kids. Um, so we're actually getting calls from districts as well around working with them. Um, so that it's kind of varies by market, but yes. We do. So you guys are right in the backyard of the Edible Schoolyard in Alice Waters, which is, uh, gosh, I wish that was going on in every school district around the country. But um, so Alice Waters is a, an informal advisor of ours, and so is uh, Ann Cooper, the chef that works with her. And I mean, I can tell you when I was at, uh, Sebastian, by the way, made me promise to say that IVD was the original link for Rev Foods, because when I was at... <laughs> And you may wonder how, but it's kind of true. <laughs> um, because when I was at Haas in my IBD project, um, Kirsten and I both did, I did um, sort of food security in Ethiopia, and she worked on 
uh, school feeding systems in Ghana, and the funder of that program, Dick Beers, um, was, is a, a big uh, supporter of Berkeley and is very close to Alice Waters. So we had lunch with her, I'll never forget, in, in business school, had lunch with her at Chez Panisse, um, which was quite an experience and kind of told her our idea. And so certainly, she, uh, we don't work directly with her, but she's certainly uh, knowledgeable about what we're doing and, and supports it, so, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So you're right. I did, um, and I think probably I'm guessing Kirsten had many as well. Um, you know, I, the one part I didn't um, mention, which is probably obvious from hearing me speak, but I'm a huge foodie. I love food and I love to cook. And um, you know, in talking with. Um, you know, a lot of the diligence I was doing at school sites around what are some of your greatest needs, food kept coming up again and again and again and again. And, and from a personally selfish perspective, I'm like, if I can combine food and education, that's the coolest job I can imagine. So, I mean, part of it came from the market opportunity and part of it's just a, a personal, you know, passion in those two areas. Yep. Yep. Well, I mean, I think there, um, there's a lot of, a lot of um, real data out there right now that over, I think the last study I read um, was that over a third of our youth are clinically obese, and this is from the national, um, the NIH, so, um, and over 75% of those youth will become obese adults if tracking continues as is right now um, in terms of what we've seen in the past. So, I mean, there may be, I don't know. So I, I, I definitely, 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 I mean, you should come out and see the schools that we work with. Um, when you look at the students that we serve, I mean, this is actually back to your question, another one of the inspirations for starting Rev Foods. I mean, we were walking into lunchrooms where easily, you know, 75% of the kids were severely, severely overweight, and that still holds true. Um, in the populations we're working in. So um, I think it's a major issue. You know, I think we can argue about statistics and, and kind of where it is and different. I think there's, there's questions about school-based intervention versus out-of-school intervention and how effective it can be when, you know, fast food and things like that are such an impact after school. Um, but I certainly feel like, you know, seeing the impact that we're seeing that it's well, well worth the effort. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so that's a great question. That's sort of our next frontier. So right now we're collecting a lot of anecdotes and testimonials from, from um, schools and administrators primarily and from board members. Um, we've now been approached by a group of researchers. Actually, um, it's a uh, collaboration of, of Berkeley, McGill, and Harvard, um, a group of researchers who want to launch sort of an official study um, around the schools that we serve. It's a very complex undertaking, and I think Kirsten and I have, and I have always thought, you know, we're not... Um, professionally qualified to take on a study, but I think we're at that juncture whereby there are enough institutions that are interested. Oakland's Children's Hospital is very interested in working with us to look at um, change in schools. And actually, one of the most interesting things is there is, while there is focus on you know BMI and weight and kind of very concrete metrics, there's also a lot of focus on attitudinal changes around food. So if you have students who have never eaten fresh fruit and are now eating two pieces a day, how does that change their trajectory in terms of the health choices that they're gonna make? That's the kind of stuff that we're collecting right now um, is, is the, I'm not gonna say the softer side, but you know, um, we're jumping now into um, the more analytical side, which I think will be important because we're um, being addressed. Uh, Tom Harkin's office just called us and said, you know, how can we use Rev Foods as a national model for um, how we can have healthier food in schools? But we definitely need to jump into that, that realm of more research-based study. In terms of academic performance? So they're looking more at like dietary and um, sort of health related outcomes, but um, you know, certainly that would be another sort of partnership with an education, I think, research organization to look at performance. Um, our schools are sort of tracking it informally and reporting back to us on attention to detail and in class and um, uh, a lot of times how breakfast correlates to um, test, test taking because a lot of their tests are in the morning periods. So 
but it's a great question. I'd love to come back and speak in a year and tell you where we are on that, because it's, it's definitely our next horizon. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and you mean in, in terms of other cities coming to us now? So it, it's really um, word of mouth. I mean, I think, you know, the education reform community is, is, is smaller than you might think it is. So there are a couple, you know, kind of key players nationally. One of them sits on our board, the New Schools Venture Fund. Um, and there's a lot of talk, so I'm in, at conferences and panels, and um, you know, there was, I was a summit, at a summit in D.C. this uh, May where they had us speak to a whole group of national um, charter school and education leaders. So really word of mouth and getting out there and telling the story and um, you know, people who have a lot of school leaders who just are just fed up with the lack of options. So yeah, I think we could do it. We haven't done a big PR effort. We haven't... Um, you know, we haven't invested a lot in it financially, but I think we've been pretty good about telling the story and getting out where we can. Um, so, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I wish it was so. I wish it was. I'd say we've gotten better at it, but I mean, honestly, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of. Op I mean. This is such an operations logistics company. I mean, when you look at like our timeline to launch and the Gantt chart that we run on, you know, all the pieces that have to come into place in order to launch a kitchen, um, it's one of the toughest parts of what we do. I mean, when you're talking about a business that ramps up, we went from 50 to 100 employees in 60 days this summer. So you think about the training and um, just the challenges that come with that from an HR perspective. And we can't hire people earlier because we don't have the budget to do that. So as much as I'd love to, you know, bring people on six months in advance and train them, you know, it's like we're limited by our budget because of our mission in a way. Um, and so it's super challenging. So I'd say we're getting better at it. I mean, now instead of having, I'll give you a, a concrete example. So when we launched our second market in LA, we hadn't really figured out this, like I laugh, I call it the tiger team strategy where you have like, you know, this group of, um, launch experts who go out and launch and one of them's focused on ops and one of them focused on hiring and one of them's focused on sales and one of them's focused on you know food safety whatever your categories are um, we would say okay Kristen go to LA for one month and like you know cover the launch and Kirsten go to LA for one month and Amy go, you know and we realized really soon in that that's that's not the way to scale a company you've got to have like your functional expertise that covers and so I mean we're learning as we go and um, I'd say we brought on you know certainly brought on more expertise to our management team um, there are people that do this really well. Um, so, for instance, we're talking to someone who scaled um, the Cheesecake Factory from, you know, two locations to, you know, 200 locations and how you get in the mind of that launch planning and make sure that, that you're doing it well. But it's, it's a huge challenge. Yeah. I'm looking at number three saying, you know, number three has got to be easier than number two, and I think we've got the right places, the right pieces in place, but um, it's, uh, it's one of our biggest challenges in the time frame we operate in. It certainly helps us make a decision about which market to go to as long as there's a population of kids that fit kind of our criteria for service. Um, but it doesn't help in the everyday what it takes to get it done and um, you know, kind of the, the manpower slash woman power that it takes to, to get one of these commissaries up and running. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was laughing when I said number three because I'm like, do they think I'm talking about kids or facilities? <laughs> um, no, so it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's challenging. I mean, I think Kirsten, so Kirsten, um, I had a baby two days before graduation at Haas, and then, um, you know, now I'm having my second. Kirsten had one one year into our operation, and, um, you know, we've, we've struggled. I mean, for one thing, we have unbelievably supportive partners at home. So, I mean, I don't know what I'd do without my husband. I mean, he's incredibly supportive, and we you know, work hard on, on being 50-50 parents and sharing and supporting, but I think the key is building a great team and empowering your team and delegating effectively. I mean, you can't do it all yourself. I had a board member say to me, you know, we didn't invest, you know, millions of dollars in your company for you to do it all. We invested in it because we trusted that you were a capable leader who would attract talent to your team and then delegate and empower that talent or delegate to and empower that talent. So, I mean, that's, I had a, another board member who was a, a really well-respected CEO prior to starting a venture capital fund who said to me, 
Your job is recruiting. That's your job now as CEO is recruiting. So I mean, I think, I think that's, that's the key to me is finding the right team members. Um, we're getting better at it. They will always, people will always tell you when you start a company, hire sooner than you think you need to. And nine times out of 10, you won't because if you're like me and you're very you know, analytical and financially conscious, you kind of hold on to the reins. No, I don't need to make that hire. I can wait three more months. I will never take that approach again. I mean, I, I think you gotta staff your team correctly and, and make sure that, um, that your, your key places in the org chart are covered by good people. And um, cut your losses quickly too. I mean, that's the other tough lesson is, you know, they always say hire slow, fire fast. I mean, when things aren't working out, you can't hold on to, uh, you know, given the, the appropriate procedure and, and support that you've given someone, if it's not working out, don't hold on for longer than you need to because you gotta be, gotta move fast and be effective, so. Sure, yes. Oh, that's a great question. So we did, um, sorry you guys, this keeps falling. We did, um, we did think about being a nonprofit. Um, one of the key reasons we decided to be a for-profit is because we wanted to scale. It was a revenue generating model. You know, built, one of the first things I did was build, this is, this is, this is where banking does come in, you know, built a, a super complex financial model, um, looking at the five year, uh, you know, five year projection for where we wanted to be and realized we can make this a sustainable, you know, a, a sustainable company. And I think one of the primary reasons for not becoming a nonprofit was sort of the, the scale aspect. So as someone who spent, I guess, five years of my career in nonprofit fundraising, it's, Fundraising consumes you a lot of times in nonprofit. I mean, depending on who you're working for, but um, we really wanted to focus on execution and scale. And we had a theory that if we could operate this model in a financially successful way, that we could tap into capital markets and scale faster than if we were a nonprofit. And because one of our key um, mission pieces of our mission was impacting as many kids as possible, that meant being able to scale effectively and quickly. And so tapping into um, into capital, and it's it's proven right at this point. Um, and then social mission wise, no, we haven't had a hard time sticking to our social mission and it's because we've built it into our charter. So the kids we serve, we built that into you know, our business plan from day one and we communicated, communicated it to investors. So definitely when you start that company, communicate that to investors from day one. Um, you know, we said over 50% of our portfolio will be low income students. We will pay our employees above livable wage. We will run a green company to the extent possible. So these are, these are um, things that drove, have driven our mission from day one and it's also attracted the type of investor we bring in. So if you look at our board, you know, we're working with investors that focus on um, companies that promote economic development in low income areas, companies that run a sustainable, um, a green, you know, one of our investors, Wesley Group, is focused on green. Um, we've got, uh, you know, investors like Catamount that are focused on healthy foods. So we've matched that mission to the investors that we brought in, and that's so important if you want to stay focused on your mission. Okay, well, I would like uh, to thank you very much, Kristen, for making ah. us really hungry. <laughs> at, uh, um, somewhere. Somewhere I have a bottle of wine which you won't be able to drink. Oh, perfect. Oh, I can have. This is for your husband. Glass a day. <laughs> and once again, thanks everybody for coming next week's uh, engineering. Thank you. Thank you.